delicious blend of unity. Amen. Good morning, River's Edge Church. My name is Ryan White. If you don't know me, uh, I'm new. I'm the new family pastor here at the church, and it is my joy to be able to open up God's Word with you this morning. So this morning we're talking about unity. We're talking about what it means for us to be a united church for the world. But I want to start us off this morning with a question, a simple question. What is the church? Now, I realize it's morning, so I'm going to make it even easier to kind of jumpstart your thinking. I'm going to make it multiple choice. So, choose the best answer. Which of these best describes this thing called the church? So, is the church A, the physical place where the people of God gather together for worship? Is the church A, the physical place that we gather for worship? Or maybe the, it's B, the church consists of any individual across the globe, living or dead, who's placed their hope and trust in Jesus. Or maybe it's C, the church is a community of faith, a family of believers centered around Jesus who are living together under his leadership and authority. Which is the best answer there? Is the church a place, a status, or identity that we carry, or a family that we're a part of? Some of you might want to say D, all of the above. Some of you don't like standardized tests. You don't like how questions are framed in this way. But it's not just semantics. I think that this is actually really important how we answer this question. Because, and this is actually going to be your first fill-in, this is kind of a an overarching truth for this morning. The way we see the church influences how we behave and interact with it. The way we see the church influences the way we behave, and actually it should be participate within it. Try to wrap your mind around that. The way that you're kind of conceiving of what this thing is that we're a part of will change how you engage once you walk through the doors. And I think too often I kind of come to church with this mentality that the church is an institution that's there to support me, to encourage me in my walk of faith. And on the one hand, that's absolutely true. The church is here. It it builds us up. It challenges us. It encourages us to live faithfully as we follow after Jesus. But also when I'm thinking of the church that way, it's kind of telling the story as if I were the star of the movie. I was the leading man and that this was about me. But actually, I think what God's doing in the church is actually far more communal than just kind of my unique personal relationship with Jesus and following after him. This is kind of the image that I've been thinking about as I'm trying to imagine what is God doing here through the church. So picture yourself, you're you're in the ocean. You've been shipwrecked, and you're kind of struggling for life in the waves, and a lifeboat comes over, and a strong arm reaches down and hauls you into the boat and rescues you. That's kind of our personal, intimate, private moment with Jesus, our Savior, as he he snatches us out of the waves and throws us into the boat. But then something happens once we get in the boat. We blink a few times, and we realize that we're not alone in there. That the boat is filled with other rescued souls. And some of them are familiar familiar to us. Some of them are strangers that we don't know at all. And then we realize that Jesus isn't just ferrying us back to our old life. He's got a different purpose in mind. He's actually recruiting a crew. This kind of team, this family that's working under his leadership and working together to go back out into the waves, back out into the storm to rescue more and more people from the waters. And then when God gets a hold of us, we start out as these, these survivors, these guys that have, and men and women who've been rescued. But what Jesus is intending is for us to become full partners with him and heirs in this kind of family rescue business. We're going back out with him as a crew, as a team, as a family. So we can't forget that when Jesus saves us, he saves us to community. True, we all come in one by one individually. We're individually hauled into the boat, 
We have this kind of personal act of repentance and placing our trust and our faith in what Jesus did on the cross and through the empty tomb. But once we're in the boat, we're saved into the family of God. And we have this new relationship with our Heavenly Father, but we also have this new relationship with a new set of spiritual brothers and sisters. And we've been recruited into a family enterprise, which is what God is doing in the world. And this is actually exactly what the Apostle Paul has been talking about to the Corinthians as we've been journeying through this letter of 1 Corinthians. He's trying to get them to see who they are and to get a bigger picture of what God is doing and why he's gathered them together as a community around Jesus. And he's been hammering on this issue of unity because the Corinthians have become a divided bunch. They've been bickering and fighting, and Jesus wants to give them a bigger perspective. So Paul writes this letter to kind of change the way they view the world. So, let me just give a brief review. This is like our third week through 1 Corinthians of where we've been. You'll remember that Corinth was one of the major economic and cultural centers of the ancient world. It's this uh, Roman seat of authority in the heart of Greece, and it's the city that's teeming with prostitutes and sailors and philosophers and merchants, Roman administrators, and really people of every culture and religion imaginable. And Paul came, he spent about a year and a half in the city, he told people about Jesus, he started this church, and then God moved him on. And the Christians that he left behind, they, they kept on pursuing Jesus together, but things kind of went cattywampus along the way, and they start bickering and fighting, and what they're fighting about is who they like preaching best on Sunday mornings. You see, Corinthian culture valued wisdom and speaking ability, so they gravitate to their favorite preacher in the pulpit. And the thing is, you know, Paul was an all right preacher, but the kid that followed him, this guy named Apollos, was amazing. He was one of those super eloquent, persuasive speakers that he could have the audience laughing one second and in tears the next. It was just his gift. God had given him the ability to speak. And so people are just super excited. And even the outsiders, the pagans, are like, man, that kid talks good. But you know people, they can't just leave it at that. It's like, well, you know, Paul never spoke like that. He never preached with such eloquence and insight, you know. Good thing that guy's gone. Good riddance, we're Apollos people now. The people that knew and loved Paul are like, uh, Apollos is okay if you like that sort of thing. You know, it's not my style. He's a little too showy, a little too academic, a little too emotional. You know, just give me the traditional old-timey gospel. That's all I need. I don't have any use for Apollos. And they start splintering into these cliques. Then you have another crew that's like, we're following Peter. Peter's never been to Corinth. But they're like, oh, no, I don't care. We're following Peter. Neither of those two. And then there's like the anarchist kind of folks in the congregation. They're like, you know what? No leaders, just an empty pulpit on Sundays. No more sermons. We're good. Just music, read scripture, that's it. And Paul says, you guys have descended, and this is his words, into jealousy and strife. The community of faith has broken down. So he writes this letter as a corrective but not just to scold them, but to give them the ability to see differently. So he says, what is with this thing about I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter? You're acting like people who've never met Jesus. Don't you realize that we all work for the same guy? That we all bat for the same team? And we'll pick it up in verse 5. This is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. The one that matters, only God who gives the growth. 
He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. In other words, we're not in competition with one another, guys. Paul says, I planted the church, Apollos is building it, but this is God's project, not ours. But this isn't just the hammer. He also wants to give them corrective lenses. He knows that their vision has skewed. They've kind of fixated on their preferences and their attachments. And it's causing this, this breakdown in the fellowship of God's people. So he wants them to see this church, what they've found themselves a part of from a new perspective. He wants them to see the church as God sees the church. So he's going to spend the rest of this chapter giving them new images of what this thing called the church actually is. And this is what he says. You, and when you hear these words, you, know that it's plural. It's not you individually, it's you collectively. You together collectively are God's field. You're God's building. And then dropping down to 16, don't you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So what do you hear in that? Well, the first thing that jumps out to me is that all of them have that possessive, God's. This is God's field, God's building, God's temple. And then this is one of your fill-ins on your notes. The church is not ours. It's God's. He is the one who's running whatever this is. He is the one who's in charge. He's the one who sets the vision and agenda. The whole field belongs to him. Anyone who's here, pastors, teachers, nursery workers, financial supporters, they all answer to him. This is his thing, and we're just a part of it. We also realize that we read in verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's already set the kind of vision and agenda and scope of the church in stone. It's his thing. It's God's. So the church is not ours, it's God's. But what is he doing? What is the thing that he's doing? Where well, he says we're God's field. In this community, God is growing something. He's cultivating life. He wants to see life itself spring up and break out in our lives. Life and victory. There's something that is both organic and mysterious about what God is doing through the church. That's actually your next fill-in. The church is organic and mysterious. It's organic. It requires work. There's planting, there's watering, there's pulling weeds, there's fertilizing. It's kind of this natural process that involves hard work. But on the other hand, it's a mystery because it totally depends on God. He's the one who brings the growth. He's the one that causes life to burst forth from the ground. It's this kind of divine human partnership, and we get our hands dirty, but we trust that God is the one who's making the plants grow. So when the church is functioning as it should, we're working together alongside Jesus, working to see life and fruit burst out in people's lives. And what is this fruit? It's what we just did, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what God is growing, that is what he's cultivating because he wants to see it overflow for the benefit of both our lives and for the world. So he says the church is God's field. But he also says the church is God's building. The second image comes from this world of construction. We read in verse 10, and this is Paul talking, remember, according to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, but someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. 
The thing that we notice first about this building is it is not a finished, pristine cathedral, but it is an active construction site. We see subcontractors and laborers milling about, doing their work. And this is because the church is an ever-expanding building. That's your next fill-in. An ever-expanding building. It's always under construction. It's always under renovation because God is a big-hearted God. This isn't a static picture because our God isn't static. His love overflows and he always wants to make more room for more and more people to come in and to make their home with him. So things are always in flux. They're always under construction. And it's this little reminder to us that we can't get comfortable. We get really excited about where we sit on Sunday mornings, about our rhythms and our routines, and that's, that's good. But we've got to hold them loosely because the building's always growing. We're in this active construction zone because God doesn't want it to just be us at the end. It is his heart that none would perish, but all would come to find life and hope and a home in him. So are we willing to be a bit uncomfortable so that God can keep building, keep growing this building? The third image actually lets us know what type of building we are. It says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, what's a temple? In the Old Testament, the temple is the primary residence for God on the earth. It's this place where he dwells and he makes himself uniquely available and accessible to people. So in the ancient world, if you wanted to have an encounter with God, you went to his temple to meet with him. If you wanted to praise and offer a sacrifice and give thanks to God, you rightly did it at his temple. It was this place of encounter where God said, okay, I'm going to set up shop and you can come and encounter me and I'll be here for you. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain tears in the temple from top to bottom and it's as if God is saying, I no longer build, live in houses built by human hands. I'm taking up residence somewhere else. Okay, well, where? You are the temple. And this is key. God has chosen to be present in the world, in and through a specific community of human beings. God has chosen to be present in the world in and through a specific community of human beings. If someone wants to go encounter God, they don't wander off into the woods for a time of quiet reflection. Now, it's true we can't escape God's presence. It's not that he's not there in the woods, but he says, I am uniquely accessible and available in a special way right here in the church where my people are gathering. Jesus says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. If you want to meet God, you come here to church. If you want to see God's spirit at work, you come here. If you want to rightly offer up praise and thanks to your creator, you come meet with my people. Now think about that for a minute. That's an amazing, profound truth. But it's also this incredible responsibility. Paul goes on in verse 17. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. God's temple is holy. It's set apart for a purpose so that men and women, boys and girls, can come and experience Jesus. So they might come and see his face clearly in us. So that they might know Christ's love for them through the love we share together as a community. If anyone destroys God's temple, do you remember who it was in Corinth that was destroying the temple of God? It wasn't 
the pagan authorities persecuting the church. It was the Christians who were bickering and fighting and arguing about which pastor they liked best up sharing the word on Sunday mornings. It was the church that was obscuring the face of Christ in their community and throwing up roadblocks for people that wanted to come and experience and encounter Jesus. And God was not pleased. And that's why Paul lays upon them this charge. He says, Let each one take care how he builds upon this foundation of Jesus, what Jesus has accomplished. He says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become manifest. It will be revealed for what it is, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. He's saying we can build this structure, this community, in different ways. We can do hasty work, Uh, we can use shoddy materials, we can build something that looks great on the outside but is rotten in the core. Or we can build something that will withstand the actual tests and trials and traumas of real life. Earthquakes and floods and fires. Uh, This makes me think about something at my last church. We uh, had this kind of wonderful, glorious pavilion that was going to be this thing where uh, we had shade and the neighbors could come and encounter God. And it took us years to build it, and it was, it was beautiful, and it was wonderful. But then they, one day we looked up, and they're like, oh, there's a water spot. I wonder what that is. So someone's like, well, let's, let's check what the inside looks like. And so they poked a hole in the stucco, and the entire beam, in liquefied form, flowed out. And we realized, oh, it's only the stucco that's holding up the pavilion. It looked great on the outside, but it put people at risk who came to encounter Jesus. It wouldn't withstand the tests and trials and traumas of real life. And that's something that our church community, it's a warning. We might feel all warm and friendly and engaging, but can someone really come in here and encounter Jesus? Or do they hang out for a little bit and then it's like, oh, just under the surface there's There's bickering and complaining and and backbiting and jealousy and and people arguing about politics and preachers. Is it this thing where there's people's lives at risk and people possibly missing the opportunity to safely come and see the face of Christ? If the work that anyone has built on this foundation survives, He will receive a reward. The laborer will receive his wages. If anyone's work is burned up, if it fails, if it injures someone, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you hear God's heart in all of this? It's not condemnation. It's that God What we do here as the community of faith is really, really important to God. Whether we like it or not, this is God's plan. He wants the world to experience Him through our life together. He's put a sign out. He says, you want to experience God? You want to see God in the flesh? Go to church. There's part of me that kind of wants to stand in the door and say, no, don't come in. You're going to get the wrong impression. We don't have our acts together. We're, we're a mess. You're going to get, you're not going to see him rightly. But to that, Jesus says, you are that temple. By God's grace, my spirit is here working among you. I am doing a good work in you. It's a spiritual fact Now move forward in partnership with me. You are my field. Cultivate life and growth and let life be unleashed in people's lives. Renovate and expand my building. Always make room for more and more people to come and make their home with me. 
and be my holy temple, set apart so that in our life together, someone might walk in and encounter the living God at work in you, in me, in us, in our country, in our world. That's what it means to be the church. He wants us to have a bigger vision. You all are my field, my building, my temple. So take care how you build. Because it will get tested. There will be trials and traumas of real life, and we don't want people to get hurt. We want people to find the rock that is Jesus that they can build their life upon. And we want to evidence that in how we do life here together. So that's my challenge for you guys today. Take 1 Corinthians 3 for the afternoon. Reflect on it and ask, are we building our community, our church, our family of faith in such a way that it enables people from outside to come and encounter Jesus? Because this is his plan. His plan is for them to meet him in our life together. So let me pray for us.